On this episode of Industry Relations, Rob and I try to solve housing affordability. Join us. This is Industry Relations, a podcast that's at the intersection of real estate and technology from an insider's perspective with Rob Hahn and Greg Robertson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of Industry Relations. Uh, This is your co-host, the notorious Rob Hahn, and as always with me, the fabulous Fab Robertson. Isn't that like a fabulous fab? Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm convinced. Like I'm gonna. Notorious note. Rob I'm just on. saying that. I'm. I'm gonna try and get people to change your name to Fab. I mean, that's. It's, they, it's not. Yeah. It's not Fab. Okay. For it's, anyone watching us on YouTube, Greg, as, you, as you can it's see, Greg Robertson. <laughs> it's uh, no hat day today. So it is no hat day today. I'm, yeah. You know, it's like my hair. When it grows out a certain way, it looks like I have a toupee on, I think. You know, it just kind of falls <laughs> flat there. Maybe because I, I had a hat on earlier and it's just kind of whatever. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, you know, we're both blessed uh, not to uh, need toupees, I think. Yes. We, we lucked out in the genetic lottery on the hair front. At least. Not a lot of other things, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not blessed with height, either of us, but, uh, you know. I'd rather be bald and 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 like six three, but that's that's just me, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so listen, um, that that was a fun episode last week. Thanks for letting me promote my company. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks to listeners for that. But um, today we're going to try something we we really haven't done very much, Greg. You know, and it occurs to me, maybe we should because fact is, you've been in real estate how many decades? God, 33, three decades, yeah. Three decades, over 30 years. I've been in it since 2004, right? So 20 years for me, you know? I mean, I, I think it's reasonable to think that we, we could be considered fairly knowledgeable, maybe even experts in this whole real estate thing. Um, we've seen all sorts of markets, you know? And uh, right now, as you know, housing affordability is like the topic, you know, not just in real estate, but like society as a whole, economists, you know, everyone's starting to talk about it. And it doesn't seem like their solution. I thought, you know what? Let's be idiots and talk about our perception of what the solution is for bringing how to make housing affordable. That's the topic. Okay. And we'll so just, just throw just, ideas out. Okay. So here's just for the viewers and listeners here. Rob has suggested this idea for a conversation, which means Rob has thought about this and he's got some things he wants to put on the table. I'm yes. coming into this completely <laughs> blind. Seriously, five minutes ago, it's like, what do you want to talk about today, Greg? Or I, I said to Rob, what do you want to talk about? He says, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm here flat footed. Uh, he's, he's, he's loaded. Okay. But I'm not, I'm, I'm really not. Exercise. Okay. I, I'm really not. So I'll give you the, a little bit of background. It's because okay. I'm doing a bunch of presentation in the next couple of weeks. And one of the topics I'd like to talk about is the monetary system. You know, blah, 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 demographics. Uh, so as a result of that, I was doing a lot of research and things like demographics. And the thing I cannot help but see, and we've mentioned that we've touched on it because it's not like some secret, is how younger people, millennials and Gen Z, can't buy houses. I mean, they just can't afford it, right? Um, there was a YouTuber I listened to. Again, these guys aren't economists. They're not housing YouTubers. They're like your, you know, your typical political, cultural YouTube uh, podcast guys, yeah, but they're young. They're they're Gen Z, but they're in the UK. So we're talking about how none of them can afford to buy houses, and they talked about like looking at home prices the year you were born, right? As like the boomers <laughs> who were born like in the forties and fifties, they won some sort of generational lottery because you know the average home price in the in the UK. They're using UK numbers. I didn't look it up for the US. Was like. 15,000 pounds, you know, like in right. 19, you know, um, 1971, which is when I was born, you know, apparently UK houses were like 70,000 pounds. And today it's 380,000 pounds. And, you know, the average, you know, Gen Z or makes 35,000, you know, it's like one of those things. And it's very similar to what we're dealing with. Right. And this is, so I just thought, you know, we know the problem. Right. The question is, okay, how do you solve it? How do you actually make housing affordable? Right. So let me start by, I will take this position. I do think sort of the standard 
industry answer, if you will. And I'll say NAR because NAR sort of represents the industry to a large extent. Their talking points over the last few years, last several years, has been not enough supply and we need to make financing easier, right? I will say that I don't think that's the solution. Actually, I don't. Okay, so let's so start I, there. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me let me take because I did, I did, I remember reading something on Twitter about this, but I'm gonna take the position that supply does matter, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's basic ep- economics, right? I mean, you know, when there's low supply, prices go up, right? So I don't know how right. you can say affordability isn't going to be affected by supply. So um, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll come from the perspective of like, let's let's come up with ways of solving this issue via supply. How about that? Okay. So let, let's let's start there. And here's why, I mean, I used to kind of obviously supply and demand, you know, basic fundamentals of economics is sort of makes sense. The reason why I kind of changed my mind is I found a guy, an economist actually, on Twitter, um, and I went down the rabbit hole with him. So maybe we'll put in show notes. His handle is at Economica, and uh, the name, as far as I can tell, is just CH. So I'm gonna show at least on um, at least on you know the uh, on YouTube. Uh, or on video, obviously audio listeners. I mean, I'm just showing a chart that's comparing total housing units versus working age population in the United States, right? Supply. And so supply is the total housing units and the demand would have to be total, you know, workers, right? People who can actually afford to buy houses. So let me enlarge it a little bit. So this is what he's showing. And I didn't realize this, right? Basically, what he's saying is, look, total housing units, uh, I think is in the black line, right? Blue line is population and then employees. So what he's showing is a population has really flattened sometime around 2001, right? Maybe zero, zero. Mm-hmm. And then the work workforce has really kind of flattened around like 1999, right? So, and whereas housing units keep going up, meaning we built more houses than there are population and there's workforce. So it's not really a supply and demand problem, is his point. And well, I think a there's a truth What's to a that. product that was built, right? Well, not, and the location obviously matters. So, you know, obviously housing is unaffordable if you're in San Jose, right? It's more affordable if you're in, say, Nebraska, right? But even in Nebraska, housing is getting expensive. Right. You know, one of our producers, Ben, you know, he's looking for a house and he, we were talking about it offline last week. And it's like, you know, he and his fiance, he and his girlfriend are like looking for a house and they're like, oh my God, these prices. So this, we know this is a widespread problem. Right. Especially because obviously if you're going to places where housing is more affordable, the problem is that you don't have enough jobs. Right. Which, you know, and again, in 2020 and 2021, we saw this massive spike and whatever. A lot of it was driven by work from home, where a lot of these uh, sort of laptop class employees were all of a sudden like, I don't have to live in San Francisco. I don't have to live in New York City. I'm going to move to Florida. I'm going to move to Carolina. We know that was a huge part of the driver in 2020, 2021. Of course, now they're getting screwed because a lot of companies are calling them back, but that's a whole separate conversation. (laughs) I'm just pointing out like these... Again, these are just apparently numbers, stats from an economist who's looked at it. And what he's saying is supply is not the issue. Right. Well, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous though, right? I mean, what, 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 what are we facing right now is, I mean, we're every, every realtor in the country is telling us that the, the stat, I'm not sure where this chart comes from, but they may have built something, but right now we are having a, a, a supply crisis, right? It's low inventory everywhere. And that mm-hmm. is a factor in driving the, the price of homes up. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I see this chart here, but it's not any basis in reality right now. Is what, it, right? what are you I mean, talking? It's hundred, it's housing units in the United States. We have more than we've ever had. Right. So my point is that the talking. So, so point why, from why, what, what is everybody talking about on, you know, about there being low inventory? What is NAR? What are the real estate experts? What so, are talking about being low, low supply then? Right. So I've seen like Mike Simon, our friend Mike Simonson, you know, who runs Altos Research. Yeah, He's yeah. probably one of the best in terms of real estate data. Uh, what he talks about is he thinks is because a lot of sellers just sitting on the sidelines. They're not selling 
because they they've got a three percent mortgage okay, so rate. There's a, but, uh, okay, great. But the units That's... exist. Is my point right? Okay. So so yeah. So no, this is great because this goes into what I'm talking about. Is like how you can increase supply, right? Um, let, let me let me let me let me posit this uh, since we're on this, right? It's it's Go not ahead. about increased supply. It's about how to make housing affordable. But but again, it's 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 a you know it's a, a it, it, it's a factor, you know, supply and demand. I think if you have more supply, the prices are going to go down. I mean, you're arguing that that's kind of no, of course not. Of course not. Line. Okay, all no, right. of course not. I'm just saying that the the talking point from the industry for ten years, ten plus years, for as long as I've been in the industry, we don't have enough supply. We're not building enough. We're not building enough. We're not building enough. Right. And it's like, apparently we built enough, at least as relative to population and the workforce, right? If we keep building at this current rate, we're actually going to have an oversupply of housing, right? Too many houses and not enough people who can afford them, not enough workers, right? So I'm saying that's not the issue. The current inventory crisis, it seems, has more to do with existing homeowners just saying, I don't want to sell. Right now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at, if you dig into that data a little bit more, new new home construction builders they're trying to they're trying to get rid of inventory as fast as possible, right? So fundamentally, it's like we could talk supply and demand, but I don't actually know if that's true. Now there may be different isolated pockets. Again, maybe if you're in San Francisco, if you're in Austin, if you're in LA, you know, like obviously real estate is geographic, but as a national level, when housing is unaffordable nationally, it doesn't seem like it's because of a lack of supply. It seems like it's because prices have just gone way the fuck up, right? Like way beyond like anything reasonable, you know? Um, so as an example okay, of this, okay. to support this statement, let me finish this and then respond. We know that housing shelter component of inflation is one of the biggest drivers of inflation and has been for a couple of years now. And the reason why the Fed is raising rates so aggressively is because they're trying to crush housing. If they could crush home prices, if they could crush rents, yep. their thought is it's going to you know, bring CPI it's, down. Right. It's not coming down, man. The latest inflation print was housing is like- Yeah, the prices the are going up still. Right. Yeah. So anyway- It's right, a good so, argument for that, C, for that you know, upcoming uh, 25 basis points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I might be buying a stake because I, sh I should have bet on June, but that's all right. I'm happy to buy a <laughs> okay, stake. Okay, so let, 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 let me, let me, maybe, maybe, let me, let me look at it from a different angle. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've, I've stolen a little bit. The, my inspiration here comes from uh, uh, Brandon Doyle. He's uh, on Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. With, uh, yeah, I know Brandon. Doyle Realtor. Okay, so yep. he's got some three things about how do you fix housing supply, but two of them are based upon, um, Owner occupancy, right? Mm -hmm. So let me, let me spread, you know, spread out these things. First of all, the first one observation is not so, um, uh, you know, groundbreaking. We, we talked about this before, but that basically is nimbyism, right? We've got to reduce the way of the, the permits and fees and everything. We just got to make it easier to build units, right? Now that might go against what you're saying as far as there's enough of those, but I think the right kind of product affordable kind of product out there would, would mm -hmm. help out a lot. And that's got, sure. hell, I live in Huntington beach and they're famously being sued by the state of California because sure. they do not want to urbanize Huntington right. beach, which is ridiculous. Right. right. The second thing I think has that are go more towards this owner, the owner occupancy thing, meaning maybe there's not a lot of, a lot of the supplies because a single homeowner owns are not occupying, you know, those houses, they, they might own two or three income properties, and that's really keep, that's more of a renter thing. So the first one is I thought was kind of cool was the government should temporarily reduce or eliminate capital gains for any residential property that is sold to an owner occupant. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's something there as far as if we can, you know, if we can give some motivations on tax wise, mm -hmm. that might be a thing. The other thing that he says is homestead status should actually mean something. Meaning the reduction for owner occupants should be higher and the property, um, uh, for properties that's owner occupied than ones that are, uh, you know, for investment or they're, you know, they're renting out should be higher, right? So if you've got, if you're renting it, if you're renting out a property, the taxes on that property should be higher, uh, uh, than, than one that you're actually living in, right? Okay. So those taxes should be lower. Uh, so, so punitive taxes three. on investors, right? right. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a little bit going on that in LA with this mansion tax a little bit too. There's, there's other kind bit. of things, uh, but these, these last two things I think that he's bringing up are really focused on these investor type of things or right. you know, owner occupancy thing. Right. right. So, maybe okay. We so something about those things. Sure. Um, so let's actually dive because I've seen that a lot, right? A lot of suggestions from various economists and, you know, analysts. And to be honest, most of it has come from the political left. I mean, this unfortunate housing has become a political issue, like everything is a political issue, where they talk about things like housing is a human right, and you shouldn't allow investors to essentially own housing. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's actually just extend that. Let's just say we ban rent. You're no longer allowed to charge rent. You cannot make money from housing. Again, total thought experiment, right? right okay. Total thought experiment. How does that make housing affordable? Right. Again, you know, I think what you're 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 suggesting. I think that, that there's still not owners. Right. There's still not owners. Right. You take the crazy ass version of what Brandon is suggesting. What Brandon is saying is, tweak the tax code so maybe you pay a ten percent tax if you're an investor. I'm saying let's just go all the way down the ridiculous extreme of that and say, hey, no more landlords. Land being a landlord is banned. You cannot charge rents anymore. Okay. The, the way I think about that is that reduce makes housing more affordable because all the investors essentially lose their ass, right? I mean, okay, all their assets became worthless overnight. They just dump it, right? So what it would do is drive the price of housing down dramatically. Now, the question there is, let's say we do that. It's not going to just drive investment property prices down. It'll drive all prices down. Yeah, of course. So as a homeowner, you and I, Greg, we would lose... 50% of the equity, the value of our house. Well, whatever percentage, but it, we would lose a percentage, you're right. Let, let's just go with 50 because everything I've read, I've seen so far is that housing is roughly double what the average working American can afford, right? So we need to make house costs cost half. Now, me being perfectly honest, I think I'm actually at a point it, personally where I might be willing to accept that. I might be willing to accept a 50% mm -hmm. reduction in the value of my house if that's going to save the, the, the republic. <laughs> you know, that's going right. to give young people fucking hope that they will one day own a house. However, that's not the case, I think, for most Americans. Like we like, like NAR likes to talk about, we talk about all the time. The person, the, the family residence is the single biggest asset that most Americans own. Well, it's a big, and it's, it's a biggest, uh, uh, source of wealth generation. Right. Not I mean, that, but like you know, retirement, right? Most people, most old, older, you know, re, uh, people are retiring. They're they're cashing in on, on their house and then funding the retirement. Okay, if we reduce that by fifty percent, what happens to them? Right? It's so. I I mean, there's a part of me that's real sympathetic to it, but I'm like, uh, I mean, we're you know, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> like. Holy crap, like elder suicide would be through the fucking roof, right? If we actually went ahead with something like that. Um, so fundamentally, I'm like, okay, say we, say we punish investors because what that's doing is decreasing demand, right? Fewer potential buyers in the marketplace. Right. Right. As well as potentially increasing supply because investors will sell their investment properties once it's no longer financially attractive. Okay, we can do that, and I think that will drive house prices down, but at the expense of all the homeowners. Is that the solution, right? I mean, there is a part of it that feels like, look, whatever we do, if we make housing more affordable, there's only one other way, right, to make housing more affordable. That's not going to hurt existing homeowners and existing asset owners, right? Um, and I'm not sure as a country as an industry we're ready to embrace this first sort of thing that's about make dropping home prices right i mean what's your what's your take are you willing to accept a 50 percent reduction in the value of your house yeah i mean it's it's a tough thing because i mean you know what you hear about you know the uh like what the fed's going through like we, we just talked about is they have to strike this right balance of bringing down inflation, but not, sh you know, not driving this whole economy into a recession. And that's a, that's a tough balance to kind of to for them to kind of navigate. I mean, the, I don't know. They're not going to strike one. 
Huh? No, they're 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 fucking shit up like left and right. We're we're yeah. in a recession already. It'll just become obvious shortly. I don't. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's it, this is so weird. The jobs report came out. And it was like the lowest uh, unemployment we've ever had, right? So I mean, there's yeah, a lot of different t- that, that, that's the different indicators out there. Fucking useless, right? Look at the labor force participation rate. But anyway, yeah, okay. No, I get you. It's okay. So it's all, but okay. But what I'm saying is that, I mean. You, you, you know, you're famous for making this kind of thoughts of experiments of like, let's do this, right? Mm-hmm. But that is an extreme, right? No, I'm is saying there a if balance we do where, that. Is I'm there a balance where, that. okay, but hold on. But is there a balance that we can come up that prices only go down 20%, right? And is that more palatable towards users, right? Or certain well, homeowners? I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, can we, can we, can we put some things in place that it, that, that it doesn't have to be that severe? Right. I, mean, I guess. Well, so here's the thing. I guess it depends on what what the goal is with quote affordability. If it drops by twenty percent, so maybe twenty percent of more people can then afford to buy houses, still leaves eighty percent shut out. Is that affordable? But 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 you are bringing more people in. But I mean, to me, no. I, I get some, you. There are some problems there too because. You know, as as everything is, and this is why things are so difficult. Everything's connected, right? I mean, you know, as people may know my, my my wife's a school teacher, right? And a lot of yep. schools receive their funding via taxes for property That's taxes. Right. That's right. And so, can can schools afford a fifty percent or twenty percent, you know, decrease in the funding? Um, oh, we know getting, we know right? the answer. The answer is no, they can't. Yeah, you know, right. they would have so, to do layoffs. They would have to do something. That's yeah. the answer. I mean. Okay, so and you know, I see Mirden in the chats. Like, you know, is there something where um, sometimes things are design problem? I mean, do we mm-hmm. start shi- do we start shifting home design to be more multi generational as it is in a lot of different countries? Right, sure. Where grandma's got the first floor. Sure, there's a family you know area, sure. and there's you know th- those kind of sexual things. So we can kind of bring sure. that kind of community together, right? Sure, I've I've heard that a lot, and it it actually. I get it. I get the motivation. I get the heart, right? And I appreciate kind of where people making that suggestion, where they're coming from in their heart, but I really don't like it. And here's, here's what I mean. The, you don't the want to live with grandma? That's no, not that. I'm, I'm going to talk about problems with multi-generational <laughs> living shortly, but the one that I've seen more often is like tiny houses or ADUs, right? Right. So it's not so much you know what we need? We need more density. So what we need to do is allow ADUs, allow a lot more, t- you know, smaller homes, right? For these younger generations. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's one solution. The problem I have with it is, so we're telling young people, what we're telling the working class in America today is, you should just live in this studio apartment, basically, right? For you, the whole three bedroom, two bath, white picket fence, 1500 square feet with a backyard. That is no longer your dream. You can't afford that. So instead, what we're going to do is offer you this shack, one, one room shack, 600 square feet. And then you can buy that shack for $200,000, right? And it's affordable, but it's a home. Like, I don't know if that jives with me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, well, it's, it's just a, it's just another version of like, I think, you know, my first. Home was a condo, right? And sure. I st- stuck in it for a while, and then it'd be, you know, sure. I, as my career grew, as I, sure. you know, my my earning power increased, I could then flip that into sure. a down payment for a bigger home. I mean, it's just I think it's just a matter of this is just a new way of like what what is the starting point now? It used to be a condo or a townhouse. Right. Now it's going to be a little bit lower because right. of the circumstances we're right. in now. Right? But but my point, Greg, is of course we all do that, right? We all do that. Back in even in the seventies and eighties, you know, like young couple straight out of college, you know, first job, they would go get a condo, they would rent for a couple of years, they would save up, and then they would buy the home, like the American dream home. Right. My point is, what well, we're now telling young people is like, look. The condo you can afford, the dream home you can't. When we talk about your in, as your income increases, as your career grows, my point is just look at the. If you just look at the fucking numbers, it doesn't work out. It doesn't add up, right? And we're at a point where like boomers could have bought a house in their twenties with just a husband working because the average house was like eighteen thousand dollars. Something. Sunny loves to tell this story about how her dad, twenty six years old, 
factory worker, I think he was, bought a house, like a four-bedroom house with a backyard because the price of that home was $18,000 in like 1968. Yeah. Right? What we're, I don't feel comfortable telling 30-something millennial or Gen Z couples, hey, good luck with your one-bedroom condo. You, you, know, you can afford that. But if you want to buy the the family home that you've been imagining, that's what, kind of like what you grew up in, you're going to need to make six figures, and that's going to take you the next. I mean, if you ever get, that. you know, what I'm saying it's that bothers me. So when we talk about affordability, if we start saying let's just change the physical structure, you know, physical characters of the home, I get where you're coming from. It doesn't feel like affordability to me. That that's kind of what I'm getting at. Let me talk about multi generational living real quick. Because something that I happen to be pretty familiar with culturally, because Koreans, like, that's our thing. Right? You know, it's it, this whole notion of like, of like retirement homes is a pretty new thing, culturally speaking, among my people. The, the, the idea is, you know, you, you have kids and then you have grandkids, like, and then your kids are going to take care of you. You're going to go live with your children. Like, that's always yeah. been historically. Uh, so I, like growing up, I, you know, my grandma, my grandpa lived with us, right? That was just culturally like the thing to mm -hmm. do. What we're finding with that in modern Korean society is there's a lot, lot of benefits with living with, you know, like multi generations, right? There's one ginormous downside, which is birth rates plummet. Because it turns out young people, don't really want to be doing the nasty with like grandma in the next room. So you have fewer kids. So, so loud, loud sex is, is, is the problem. I'm just saying like, <laughs> if you want to have family, if you want to have large families, fact of the matter is the couple needs a little privacy. They need space. Right. So the Korean birth rate is like 0.89. Right. You right. look at Hong Kong, it's 0.7. You look at Shanghai, it's 0.7. Replace is 2.1. And uh, some of it, has to do with the fact that in those cultures, in those countries, because housing is so unaffordable, you have multi generational living. Well, that, that's the design. Norm. That's can be designed out. So you have like a Zoom room. Now you have a boom boom room, which is maybe like, you know, yeah. There's you know it's yeah. it's it's got all the soundproofing in there. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. It's structurally yeah. maybe separate, so there's no wall banging. Yeah. Sure, um, that can be yeah. solved, right? Yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> but fun. There's fundamentally what ends up happening is then these multi generational houses have to be much larger, right? Right. It has, they have to be much larger. So you need like a suite for, for grandma, you need a master suite for the parents, and then you need three bedrooms for the kids. Okay, now we're talking about what, a 3,000 square foot house? Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, let's, so, let's, let's, go, let's go another thread then on multi-generational. Yeah. And maybe it needs that, you know, it, it's it now, it, you know, maybe families in a way are even more important um than than before where that we're going to go into this and we're going to all work hard so that i can get a house mm -hmm. for toby and i can mm -hmm. get a house for hope and i can get a house for cole but you know it's going to take all of us to help our kids out i mean i think right. that happens already right my father right. Uh, you know let me yeah uh, lent me some some money to buy my first co condominium um, but you know, it's, it's going to be more than that. It's going to be, you know, we're, it's going to be like an LLC. We have to create the Robertson family of mm -hmm. buying property, uh, you know, and thinking long-term about what that's going to look like in order for yep. anybody to do that. And that's got to be paid forward, yep. you know, as it goes along to their kids and their kids yep. And, yep. and things like that. I mean, and, and maybe there's ways that the government can help structure something, you know, um, to make it easier for families to do that to have these kind of not a for like a not a not not in the sense of 401k but a some fund that just basically goes towards immediate family living ish i, I haven't thought i mean this is coming right off the top of my head but but uh you know something like that i think we've talked about this podcast before or, or personally where you know they're building some houses around here and like I'm thinking maybe I should buy that, buy a house there, rent it out. And then when my daughter, my son or something, whatever, we, and when they're of age, I can kick the renters out and, and, and help them with that house. Right. Um, sure. 
whether it's sure. a, you know a low interest rate or or whatever, sure. right? So, sure. um, but those kind of thoughts. What do you think about that? I don't think that makes housing affordable. You know, there's like okay, so you create the Robertson Family Trust, and by the way, I have some friends who've done this. Like they do, they buy their houses through a family trust, right? Specific for this reason. Yeah, uh, it's not like you're paying less money for that house. You're paying full inflated market price. Right. 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 So that house you're going to buy is going to be whatever, 2 million bucks. Okay. You, yeah. And you can do that. And that takes care of your kids. It doesn't do anything for housing affordability. Number one, number two, down that road lies fucking revolution with guillotines and mobs with pitchforks. <laughs> right. And I'm only being slightly dramatic here because <laughs> now what you're telling Americans is if you happen to have only arc, it's only arcs basically. Basically, yeah, basically, if you happen to be born into a wealthy family, you're fine. Your parents can buy houses for you. You can set up a trust. You can do all that. If you happen to be born into a middle class, lower income family, you're fucked. You'll never own a house. Okay. Well, I At mean, that you point, know, I, I wasn't, I was born, in, not born into a, a middle class family by. Me any too. Look, I get it, man. Me too. Yeah. Me too. But my point is when we were buying houses in the early 90s, I think my first home, the first condo that I bought, which I leverage, I think our first condo was like a hundred thousand. It was like a yeah. nice condo, two bedroom in in Hoboken, like not middle of fucking nowhere. I mean, it was right, right, right next to New York City. I don't know what that condo goes for today. I'm guaranteed it's not a hundred grand. You right. know what I'm saying? It's probably more like three hundred. And I'm like, okay, now you're two young kids in your twenties. You're not you're not buying some three hundred thousand dollar house. You're just not. We had to, we barely bought that house, you know, like as young 20 somethings, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's the, dis like, how do we okay, get okay, that okay. down? All right. I'm just, I'm, I'm riffing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Here's another one. So, you know, it's like, and we, I think we've talked about this in another context, but like there's two, you know, whenever in business we've come to a point where it's like, okay, you know, we want to do these things, but we don't have the budget for it. Right. Right. Um, so we have two things we have to focus on. What number one, you know, one thing is cut expenses. Right. Yep. And that'll get us to what, you know, what we want to do. The other way is, is increasing revenues. I've always That's been right. like, I want to go out there and like, well, let's go sell more shit so we can That's do right. this without having to cut. I mean, maybe, maybe we have to look at like, uh, you know, what people are being paid. There's no question, right? Because no question. if 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 everything else has gone up and the and the and and I think there's probably some charts out there that showing that wages have not been keeping up with correct with what's what's affordable out there. Correct. And maybe maybe you know there's everybody wants to talk about a minimum wage, but maybe you know raising the minimum wage. But there's also like you know there's another thing there, uh, not just middle, not just minimum wage, but you know, is is there something more that we can do to, to affect the middle class more? I mean, I know everybody talks about that in political campaigns of cutting yeah, yeah. taxes for the middle class or anything else. Yeah, but I yeah, mean, yeah. What about how how can we how can we how can we get companies or people to increase their wages? Well, that's a yeah. this is where like, hey, I'm not an economist. I just look like one. Kind of comes to play, right? Right. Um, there's obviously no easy answer to that, but I'll, I'll give you kind of the one that I've heard from economists that I think makes the most sense. It's not even really about wages. It's about productivity. And we haven't actually really increased our productivity as a country, as an economy in quite some time. Right. So something needs to happen. And this is like what Ray Dalio has been talking about for a while. It's like make whatever investment that will increase productivity, whether that's automation, that's AI, blah, blah, blah. In the last two years, I've seen a version of that that's really encouraging, which is not productivity, kind of like government stat productivity, because they count productivity as like, you do, a, you give someone a massage, you get paid, that's productivity, right? You know, if you do financial services and you arrange a merger, then that's productivity. Right. And it's like, it's not really productivity because you haven't produced anything. Right. right. So if we get, if we go back to some older definition of productivity, that's about producing something tangible. So bringing back manufacturing or doing more agriculture or drilling for oil or whatever, right? Producing more stuff, 
If we could do that, and we are starting to onshore manufacturing back, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like that sort of thing. That might be the answer. That might be the solution. Now, having said that, the issue there is going to be that's dramatically inflationary. Unless, right. unless we truly accompany it with massive productivity gains. So one of my big complaints as an anarchist, right, as an Austrian economic economics guy, was when COVID happened and we increased our money supply by 40%, right, from the start of COVID, right? And again, Donald Trump did that. So all you lefties and Democrats could just blame Trump. Trump did that. 40% increase in money. Any any leftist president would have done that too. So it's, it doesn't well, matter. You know, Biden made it worse. So, you know, it's, it's both parties, right? My point there was, okay, we printed 40% more dollars. We didn't create 40% more chickens. So, of course, food prices are going to go up. Of course, groceries are going to get more expensive. Of course, oil is going to get more expensive because we just created more money. We didn't produce any more milk. We didn't produce chickens. We didn't produce oil. We didn't produce cars. We didn't produce houses, right? And that to me is where the supply conversation comes in really useful, right? So it's not supply. If you look at supply in terms of workers or demographics, it's oversupply. If you look at supply relative to the money supply, it's way, way below. Right. And the way I look at it, we can solve that in multiple ways. One is we could fix the money. Right. Or we have to somehow index housing supply to money supply. Or we have to, to your point, do that the revenue side and somehow figure out how to have workers be paid a fair wage. And fair wage in this case, not fifteen dollars an hour. I mean that that's just pure inflation. I'm saying fair wage in terms of productivity gain. Uh, and there's yeah, a chart. I, I can't find it, but what it shows is fucking disturbing. You show pro- American productivity gains like the, since the 70s or something. It's like this. And you look at wages, it looks like that. It's yeah. flatlined. Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. Right. That's One of the things. Up. And, and, and that's, that doesn't bode well if we increase productivity that wages are going to go up. That's the problem with that, right? But like, that's the only way we can increase wages without causing massive inflation. And well, massive- one thing I've been reading is going back to everybody knows Moore's law, right? Moore's law basically says that the number of transistors on integrated circuits will double every, was it two years? I think something and, like that. And, and basically we've on integrated circuits, we've, we've, basically hit a plateau with that, right? right. This has been a right. true thing for a long ass time. Right. So what the tech industry is focusing on or what people are focused on is like what, because that, you know, by doing that, that's been helping productivity because you can do more work with less, right? With, you know, the, uh, sure. uh, the, the size of integrated circuits and computers and whatnot. Sure. What they're looking at, and you mentioned this, is that the next level of tech basic productivity that's going to happen is AI, right? They're looking sure. at things like chat GPT sure. that are now going to help people. And, you know, I've already started using it. I'm sure you have of like, just, I'm going to type something in. It's going to give me a framework that I can like start with instead of like, yep. you know, I'm not going to put it out the way it is, but it's going to give me a, a spark of yep. inspirado yep. to get yep. going on a project or something. And that has already increased my productivity a lot. Right. So, yep. But they're looking at as, as we start fine tuning that there's going to be a Moore's law equivalent on AI as it, it relates to productivity in that's right in human beings, right? So that's I think right. there's a little bit of hope there. I mean, there's uh, like everything else, it's it's fraught with uh, some some dangers as well. But um, I know that that that's what a lot of people are looking at this uh, yeah. this new AI kind of revolution yeah. happening. Yeah. Like yeah, clearly the tech, like technology is going to have to play a major role in whatever solution we come up with. There's no question. My issue with AI, my issue with gener- all this current technology is that it's still focused on bits. It's still focused on the digital. On it's atoms. still focused on information. It has to be focused on atoms. What I want to see yeah. is Moore's law in food production. I want to see Moore's law in housing production, like actual bricks, actual you know, you know what I mean? Like we need something well, 3D like 3D printing, that. right? So things like that. They're Correct. Showing some stuff. Yeah. Correct. Uh, we need to, we need, we need that kind of breakthrough. But at the same time, here's the second part of that though. 
just like ChatGPT, just like automation, yes, it makes individuals more productive and then leads to massive unemployment. So the question is, what do you do with these people, right? And as a thought experiment, I think I propose this maybe with you just as a, as a side thing. Imagine ChatGPT or AI comes along and it's so, it's so superior, right? That we only need one out of 10 realtors working today to do all the transactions that 1.5 million are doing, right? Okay. What do you do with the other 1.3 million realtors? So here's the thing that I, the thought experiment I proposed was, what if those 1.3 million realtors went into construction? We build a shit ton more houses. I don't know right? if you build a shit ton more houses with 59 year old, predominantly women. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I get you, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm getting that. Imagine we had 130,000 spying people helping families buy and sell real estate. And we're 1.3 million people building houses. Right. Right. Or producing oil or doing forestry or farming or like producing molecules, producing atoms. What I mean, producing chips, right? Producing robots, producing That's, computers, yeah. whatever, right? Like I, I think we need that kind of productivity boom that's tied to salaries, right? So that we can have these people who are like, you know what? Every my parents told me go to school for to be a graphic designer, to go to school to be a computer programmer, working with bits, right? That's gone now because of AI. I'm gonna go to school to learn how to be a welder. I'm gonna go to school to learn agriculture, agri science, or wh whatever, right? To work with molecules, and my wages are not going to be this flatline thing. It's gonna be tied to this productivity gain. Maybe that's the way we get out of it, right? Um, but I will say this because we're, I know we're already 40 minutes in the crazy idea I've been having recently is maybe the way we get to housing affordability sooner rather than later is to get the government entirely out of housing, right? Meaning at the federal level, we get rid of Fannie, Freddie, GSEs. I think we keep the VA loan because that's very special. Right? But everything else, FHA, gone. 30 year mortgage, gone. Right? Uh, tax benefits, tax breaks for homeowners, gone. All of it gone. The mortgage introduction, gone. All of it gone. Conversely, at the local level, zoning laws, gone. Environmental protection laws, gone. You cannot regulate housing. What if we did that? Because there's a part of me that thinks, and I tweeted this out today, which is why I was inspired to make this our topic. If you, one of my favorite economists, Milton Friedman had this saying, and no economist I've ever met disagrees with it. And the saying is the cure for high prices is high prices. Because when prices go super high, other people go, oh, wait, hey, you can make a lot of money providing that, whatever that is, right? So they mm -hmm. enter the market and then create more supply and then prices drop. In housing, we haven't seen that. And I think it's primarily because, to bring it back, like, you know, full circle, local government regulations and NIMBY. But right. NIMBYs only work because local governments can regulate. So if you just eliminate the ability completely, NIMBYism will still be around. People will be pissed off, but you'd have to do it differently. You'd have to go, like, if you don't want that, that multi, that, uh, multifamily project going up in your neighborhood, you and your neighbors better get some money together and buy that land. Right. You know, it would have to be much more of a private thing. And yeah, eliminating I, all of the financial, like 30 year mortgage, blah, blah, blah. Um, part of my presentations in Canada. And I, so I ended up doing a bunch of research. The average Canadian mortgage is five years long. And the Canadians have a higher home ownership rate than we do. And I think it's because, yeah, in some cities like Toronto, Vancouver, like it's a different economy. I get it. Right. But banks are much more willing to lend if it's a five-year loan. And if interest rates spike up, guess what? At the end of five years, we're going to increase What's your What's the average home price in Canada? I can't remember. It's yeah, pretty expensive. But I mean, a five-year loan? Yeah. What's the fuck? That, but that's like 90% that? of Canadian mortgages are five-year fixed. Yeah. Wow. Right. Okay. And and again, they have higher home ownership rates than we do. 
Yeah. And their millennials are over 50% home ownership. Ours aren't. And I look at that and I go, maybe part of the problem is we insist on this 30 year fixed rate mortgage, which by the way is causing a banking crisis, right? And we have all this government subsidies <laughs> and all this shit. To what end? But it I mean, hasn't the, the average any. home price now, isn't it like in the five or six hundreds? What's a five year loan on a 500? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Again, like I said, it's a yeah. different country and, you know, how much the average is because the Canadian population is much more urban, much more concentrated, like Toronto, Vancouver, Quebec versus here. So that's the crazy idea I'm floating. I'm coming up with now and just think it through. Yeah. Right? If I we think, got rid of all regulation on, on housing, almost all, maybe in a weird way, like short term pain, right? So, you know, people who are like 30 today, I'll be like, holy shit, I can't get a mortgage now. Or I have to get this five-year mortgage or whatever. But what it should do is really slowly drop the home prices down, right? And if we could do the productivity stuff, then maybe that's the way out without, you know, without mobs and torches and pitchforks. Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to take, what do they say, a multi-prong approach. I think it has to do with wages. It has to do with regulation. It has to, it has to do with you know, um, you know, taxes, right? So yep. and it's technology. not just going to be one thing, but um, it, yep. it's a good, it's a good discussion for sure. Here's the thing. Where's the right place to, to be having these discussions? Is it only government? Is it businesses? Like where, you know, why aren't we seeing more of this happening everywhere? Right. We get we get the bitching, we get the complaining it's about just complicated. Housing it's like we talk. I mean, like as we talked about, if 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 you know everything's so connected, right? You know, house. You know, the taxes on houses affect schools, and this affects that, and this affects. I mean, everything just it's so connected. It's not you just can't make these sweeping things because other things are going to be. You know, it just affects too much. Housing just affects too much. I mean, these are complicated issues, unfortunately, right? That you just can't like, if you, if you cure one thing, you know, what is, it's hard to, what's it saying? It's hard to tell the poison from the cure, especially in this. Well, thing. the thing is this, I mean, you're going to have different problems in different sectors, but there's a part of that wonder. It's like, okay, if we got rid of a lot of these types of programs and we reduced everybody's taxes by 10%, isn't that a 10% raise? For some right. people, absolutely. No, like for lit literally everyone who has a job, it would be a 10% raise. If you pay tax, it would be a 10% raise. If you, right? So yeah, maybe that's yeah. part of it. Anyway, that's, that's where my anarchy, anarcho capitalist side is coming out. <laughs> not I, too much. Not too honest. much. I, yeah. I try to keep it in check, man. You know, <laughs> defund everything. I try to keep it in check. All right. Fun conversation, man. I, I'm, I don't think it was at all useful to our audience in terms of like what they should be doing with their business or anything. But you know what? We've talked about movies before. I feel like yeah. we are entitled to talk about whatever interests well, us. No, who world. knows? This might spark some other, some other people that are smarter people than us that are in other places that can do stuff. For so sure. I'm, I'm for sure. For sure. Well, thanks for the conversation, Greg. It was uh, always Thank a pleasure. You. Uh, right, thanks to our listeners. If they stuck to this point of two fools talking about solutions to incredibly complex problems. <laughs> and we will all talk to you all next time. Thanks. All right. Peace out, y'all.